considering the age of revolution that transformed the Atlantic world in the late 18th century. It was difficult to deny that the period was fueled by new political programs and ideologies. Reformers and radicals alike proposed changes to existing political regimes, laying the foundations for new republics and nations as the structures of royal and imperial government faltered and collapsed. In providing alternatives to traditional sources of authority and legitimacy, revolutionaries came to imagine new forms of sovereignty and ultimately aspired to create new communities that empowered the people and rejected past models. Yet revolution was never a purely political phenomenon. In challenging the power structures and traditional sources of sovereignty that propped up monarchy, radicals also sought to reorder existing social hierarchies as well. Workers and artisans mobilized behind revolutionary calls for equality, demanding an end to social status and privilege. In a similar fashion, slaves and gens du couleur in the colonies challenged the racial hierarchies that excluded them from power. As citizens, these marginalized groups endeavored to claim a place for themselves in society as equals. The street protests and revolts that occurred underscored a basic fact. Revolution promised empowerment. Workers and former slaves associated revolution with the promise of emancipation. The revolution was, in essence, their revolution, and they were willing to fight to ensure that it remained their revolution. This was equally true of another social group traditionally marginalized within old regime societies, women. As debates on citizenship and social equality came to the forefront of political life, women also sought to profit from the breakdown of traditional authority and establish social hierarchies. As one female petition stated in 1789, there is talk of freeing the slaves, why not free women also? Traditionally, women possessed very limited rights in old regime society. Treated as the commodity of husbands and fathers, women were not permitted to hold independent wealth. They could not serve in public office and had few opportunities to advance themselves through education. In most cases, women were relegated to the domestic sphere and denied a public role or identity. Various Enlightenment thinkers criticized the dependent role women endured and challenged prevailing notions of patriarchic rule. Attacks on the divine right of kings were easily translated into attacks on the divine right of husbands. Yet these opinions were hardly accepted by all. Many enlightened and revolutionary thinkers might preach social equality, but when it came to the issue of women, they retained a more conservative outlook. Rousseau himself had expressed doubts on the possibility of women entering public life. In his view, women were expected to serve the Republic as mothers, nurturing good moral values in their children and raising a generation of healthy male citizens that could sustain Republican democracy. This brand of Republican motherhood was promoted by many revolutionary reformers who continued to assert a private and domestic role for women. With the coming of the French Revolution, women were designated citoyenne, a feminine counterpart of the male citoyen, or citizen. While on the surface, feminine citizenship might appear a declaration of equality with men, differences between male and female citizens were plainly evident. Taking their cue from Rousseau, many politicians argued that women were unfit for political participation. If men were rational and suited for public life, 
women were believed to lack the necessary qualities of self-governance and independence embodied by the virtuous citizen. Women might be moral guardians of the revolution in their opinion, but it also meant that women were to be without question passive citizens with no political rights. The point was clear. Public life was unquestionably considered a male sphere of activity from which women were to be excluded. The revolution and the republic were never divorced from patriarchic attitudes that refused an active and civic identity to women. Revolutionary politicians merely reconfigured traditional attitudes along new lines, revising old arguments of female domesticity and exclusion in accordance with the principles of republican society. It was old wine in a new bottle. Various female activists rejected this view. In the first years of the French Revolution, women began setting up clubs that advocated for greater rights. Women also participated in the many street demonstrations and parades that took place after 1789, in many cases playing a prominent role in the bread riots that broke out. At times, their political activism was notable. In October of 1789, women protesters took the lead in staging a march to the Palace of Versailles, where a large crowd confronted the king and pressed their demands on an anxious Louis XVI. As clubs became centers of political activism in which citizens partook in the revolution, women sought to engage in the revolutionary fervor sweeping the country in the early 1790s. The Société Fraternelle was the first club in France to allow women active membership and was sharply rebuked by the Jacobins for its decision to do so. The radical Cordelier Club permitted women to attend sessions but never allowed them to serve as active members, and this policy was typically shared among many other leading political clubs of the day. The Cercle Club in Paris offered the outspoken Dutch feminist, Etta Palm Dalders, the opportunity to address her male counterparts and press upon them the necessity of pursuing a truly emancipatory policy as they carried out their work of social regeneration in 1790. You have restored to men the dignity of his being in recognizing his rights, so why allow women to groan beneath an arbitrary authority, she asked pointedly. Despite their presence in the clubs, women found it difficult to dispel attitudes held by many club members who refused to accept them as equal citizens. These prescriptions did not, however, prevent women from trying to enter political life. Excluded from full participation in the existing clubs, they could and did set up their own clubs in an effort to attain their own self-empowerment. Etta Palm was a pioneer in this movement. Her attempt to set up a network of women's clubs in Paris proved unsuccessful, largely due to their high subscription rates and their elite membership. Nevertheless, women's clubs did sprout up in French cities over the next year. In the minds of female activists, the club movement became the truest expression of female empowerment. Clubs presented a forum in which female revolutionary sociability advanced claims for natural rights and civic equality. As Marie Daube, a member of a Bordelais women's club, told her fellow citoyenne in 1792, Before we were forgotten, reduced to housework and the education of our children. Now, the blindfold which hid the truth from us has been lifted. In turn, we too have become free citizens. Through these forms of popular participation, women projected themselves as revolutionary actors committed to the moral good of society. 
they challenged accepted gender roles and invested the term citoyenne with a civic connotation that surpassed the limited role imagined by legislators. Through these various activities, female activists sought to cultivate a new sense of feminine solidarity, one that was closely tied to the values and ideals of the revolution itself. When it came to the prospect of female emancipation, advocates called for both social and political reform, and this was particularly the case for the writer Olympe de Gouges. Transitioning from a literary into a political writer over the course of the 1780s, de Gouges became a vocal advocate for women's rights during the revolution. She supported the abolitionist movement on principle, believing that the cause of female emancipation paralleled the struggle for liberty among enslaved individuals in the French Atlantic. In her political outlooks, de Gouges allied with the Girondins, identifying with their brand of republicanism. In 1791, de Gouges made her case for female equality in no uncertain terms publishing a Declaration of the Rights of Women and Citoyennes, an obvious critique of the Declaration of Rights issued in 1789. What gives you the sovereign right to oppress my sex, de Gouges asked her imagined male readers in the preamble, before enumerating a series of demands on behalf of women, ranging from equal property rights to political participation. Her pointed retorts questioned why it was that women had been excluded from the universal claims made by the revolution. And it called upon women to seek their own liberation if men were unwilling to grant it. De Gouges injunction of self-empowerment was consistent with her views on what the French Revolution stood for. She believed that the revolution was obliged to create a radically new type of society based on equality, breaking down the barriers that made distinctions based on race or gender. And during the early years of the revolution, she became a strong and public advocate for these views. Her abhorrence for capital punishment led her to oppose the execution of Louis XVI, and her affiliation with the Girondins only made this stance more conspicuous. As the Jacobin witch hunt began, de Gouges quickly became suspected of monarchist and treasonous sympathies. In the summer of 1793, de Gouges was arrested as the reign of terror commenced. From jail, she snuck out writings that condemned the Jacobins and the terror, hardly putting her in good favor with her captors. Three days after the Girondin leadership was guillotined on the orders of a revolutionary tribunal, de Gouges herself was sentenced to death and executed, making her one of the many victims that would be claimed by the Jacobin revolutionary terror. De Gouges' reform-minded approach to the woman question was not the only one. As the revolution became more radical, so too did female activism. Anne Pauline Léon was indicative of this changing atmosphere. The wife of a radical political journalist, Léon assisted in organizing women to foment riots and fuel the general sans-culotte protests erupting throughout Paris. As a Republican feminist, 
Léon called for the arming of female citizens and the creation of an all-woman militia, or Amazon Legion, committed to defending the capital from invasion. To press the matter, she helped create the Société des Citoyens Républicains Révolutionnaires, a club organized to recruit female volunteers and fight insurgents in the Vendée. Over the next two years, the Revolutionary Wars provided opportunities for women to demonstrate their patriotism and challenge reigning images of female domesticity and Republican motherhood. With the militarization of French society, some women fought on the front lines. In rare cases, they were awarded military honors and advanced to higher ranking positions in the military. The Société des Citoyens was indicative of the female sans-culottism growing up under the Republic. Moreover, it signaled a split in the women's movement as radical female patriots like Léon move further to the left than the elite clubists like Etta Palm. Whereas clubists agitated for women's rights through pamphlets and lobbying, militants organized women workers and made them a political force in the streets. They embraced a range of social and political issues extending beyond specific questions of female participation and gender norms. Many radicals mobilized support behind the law of the maximum proposed by politicians like Dantin. In pushing for price controls, they elicited fierce debates pertinent to the economy, the social contract, and patriotism, indicating the various registers that women used to articulate conceptions of citizenship and what it meant to be a good Republican. Occasionally, these divisions resulted in outright violence. Market women refusing to abide by the maximum became a target of the self-styled Citoyenne Républicaine Révolutionnaire, who gathered in central Paris, flaunting red caps and vandalizing market stalls to enforce the maximum. In May of 1793, well-known clubists and Girondin supporters were assaulted by a group of radical patriots in public, provoking violence in the streets. These divisions paralleled the growing tensions between enragé militants and the revolutionary leadership as the 1790s progressed. The Robespierrist desired to maintain control of Paris and preserve order. Sans-culotte agitators were a persistent obstacle to this goal, raising the question of who really held power in the capital, the government or the radical organizers. The Jacobins had hoped to use revolutionary justice and laws like the Maximum to pacify militants, but they had little intention of ceding control to the enragé. The Jacobin terror was directed against imagined political enemies, but it also took aim at specific sans-culotte leaders as well who proved unruly. It intended to break up the more radical movements and subject the popular clubs to greater government control. Attacks on the female leadership were part and parcel of this strategy. In October 1793, the Jacobin state went as far as to formally banish women from public life and forbid them from membership in political organizations. With this turn of events, Female activism was sharply constrained, suppressing the movements that had been growing up since 1789. Despite this backlash, however, female political activities revealed how ideas of revolutionary empowerment spurred certain individuals and groups into action over the course of the 1790s. Women writers and activists linked the cause of female emancipation to the broader ideals of the revolution. In adopting the universal rhetoric of revolution, 
They endeavored to frame concerns over democracy and political participation in terms specific to the woman question, arguing that the French Revolution must also constitute a revolution in women's rights and social inclusion. Advocates like de Gouges called for a new sense of feminine solidarity in these declarations. And Pauline Léon and other organizers transformed this imagined solidarity into a reality, and in doing so, attempted to ensure that a nominally women's revolution and the people's revolution were one and the same. For a few hundred women, the clubs and popular societies represented the first recognition of their existence as citizens. Although part of the general mass political ferment that clubs fueled, this experience was unique to women of the time. It also highlighted the latent contradictions inherent within revolutionary concepts of equality and citizenship. In seeking inclusion in a revolution as equals, women were compelled to make a case for themselves and focus on the specific forms of oppression and marginalization they faced. There was a certain irony evident in all of this. In the end, attaining equality compelled female activists to rebel against the political establishment and its ideology, at times pitting them against a revolution that rejected them. As the revolution became increasingly radicalized, it was evident that revolutionary politics were creating new points of conflict that threatened to fragment the imagined social unity that revolution promised. Upheaval brought into question existing social hierarchies and presented opportunities for empowerment from below. As French workers agitated in the streets, as slaves revolted in the colonies, and as women challenged existing gender hierarchies at home, the revolutionary government faced a key question. Where did this process end? Could the revolution produce and create a lasting and durable state of affairs? Or would it spiral hopelessly out of control, casting society into the abyss? As political elites grappled with these questions, a general shift in attitude was beginning to take shape. Order was needed, and this entailed bringing the revolution to an end. Yet how this would occur, and by what means, had yet to be foreseen.